Hi, I'm David, and this is the Biology Classroom. This is a paper discussion video, so get ready with this paper, and let's go through the questions and answers together. The first question is about the mammalian circulatory system. In A, you have to name the two different circulations of the double circulatory system of mammals. We have the pulmonary circulation, which transports blood from the heart to the lungs and then back to the heart. And we have the systemic circulation, which transports blood to the body, then back to the heart. Next, you have to name the main vein returning deoxygenated blood to the heart. This is the largest vein we have. It is called the vena cava. B, you have to name the type of blood vessels that connects capillaries and the veins. Capillaries first join together to become the smaller version of vein called the venu. So this is the vessel that joins the two structures together. In C, you have a diagram of a section through the heart. You have to label two things. L, to show the artery that takes blood from the heart to the lungs. L is the pulmonary artery. It transports blood out of the right ventricle. In the diagram, here is the right ventricle, so this is L. The second one is R, to show the valve that closes when the right ventricle is in systole. R is the tricuspid valve. It is in between the right atrium and right ventricle, which is here. This is a passage about the transportation of carbon dioxide in red blood cells. You need to fill in the blank. The first answer is globular, since spherical shaped proteins are the globular proteins. They are intracellular and extracellular enzymes. If it acts within the cell, it is an intracellular enzyme. The next sentence refers to the reaction catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. In the reaction, water reacts with carbon dioxide forming carbonic acid. It will then dissociate into hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. In question 2, you have the information about a virus and its structure is being shown here. Question A, name the chemical compound used to make structure S and name structure T. The structure which contains viruses' genetic material is called a capsid. It is a protein coat. So, S is protein and T is capsid. In B, you have to calculate the actual diameter of the virus in nanometer. To convert micrometer to nanometer, Multiply the value with 1000. You will get 170 nanometer. C. Suggest the role of viral DNA polymerase within the host cell. You learn this enzyme in the process of DNA replication, but the question wants you to suggest its role within the host cell. So by just naming the process it involves would not give you the mark. You have to specifically mention that it catalyzes the replication or synthesis of the viral DNA. Question D wants you to suggest how variants can be of different shapes. The shape of a virus you can observe under the electron microscope is determined by the outermost layer. So, it is due to the presence of viral envelope or outer membrane of phospholipid bilayer. Since membrane shows fluidity and is flexible, the shape of these viruses can be different. Another possibility is that the virus is being distorted or squashed during the preparation for electron microscopy. Question E, state one similarity and one difference between the genetic material of HCMV and the genetic material of a typical bacteria cell. To answer this question, you need to know that the genetic material of bacteria is naked DNA, which does not associate with histone proteins and is circular. According to the diagram, this virus also has DNA. Any correct references to the DNA is acceptable as well. For example, it is double-stranded, it is naked DNA, and it does not associate with histone proteins. The differences including bacterial DNA is circular while this virus has linear DNA. Bacteria may have smaller bits of circular DNA called plasmid, while this virus does not have it. In terms of the genes in the DNA, bacteria have genes for metabolism, while viruses do not have metabolism, so naturally they won't have the genes for it. And lastly, it is the position of the DNA. Bacteria DNA lies freely in the cytoplasm, while viral DNA is surrounded by capsid. F talks about a protein that stops cell cycle in the G1 stage. You have to outline the effects of the presence of this protein will have on the normal activity of the mitotic cell cycle. 
The cell cycle consists of G1, S, G2, mitosis, and cytokinesis. If it stops at G1, the rest of the stage does not occur. Since there is no S phase, semi-conservative DNA replication or DNA synthesis does not occur. The cell would not reach the checkpoint or could not pass the checkpoint to continue the cycle correctly. G1 and G2 phases would lead to cell growth. Without them, cell does not grow or increase in size. Lastly, a cell that cannot complete all these stages does not duplicate. Question G wants you to explain why the response to reactivation of HCMB is more likely to cause serious illness in a person who has a weakened immune system. Even though the question sounds specific to HCMV, but the reason why a person with weakened immune system falls sick more easily is the same for all kinds of infectious diseases. So you just have to answer in general what happens when someone doesn't have a normal immune system. A person with a weakened immune system may take a longer time to have an immune response. So it is easier for the virus to infect cells to replicate and spread in the body. Then provide an impact following primary immune response after viral activation. For example, there are fewer B and T memory cells present after the person is infected for the first time. The last two marks are given to any consequences of fewer immune system cells. For example, you can say that when there are fewer memory cells, there will be a reduced clonal expansion to make more lymphocytes. And if there are fewer plasma cells, there will be a lower concentration of antibodies being produced. Here you have some information about Plasmodium, the pathogen that causes malaria. A. You have to name the type of pathogen that causes malaria. Plasmodium is a type of protoctis. This passage explains that ACT, a two-drug treatment, is recommended to prevent the development of drug resistance in Plasmodium. You have to suggest why it is better than using one type of drug. According to the information above, the two drugs target different processes of the pathogen. When you use a combination of drugs, it is less likely that the pathogen can mutate against all of them. So, the possibility of the pathogen become resistant to all the drugs is lower. Also, if they already are resistant towards one of the drugs, the other one can still kill it. This ensures most or all of them can be destroyed reducing the chance of any resistant strain from passing the allele to the next generation when they divide. There is an AVP mark for any valid and reasonable suggestion. For example, you can say that if we keep the number of the pathogen low in the body, there is less possibility of mutations arising. Question 2 wants you to explain why there is an increased risk of transmission of the pathogen to other people if a person is receiving ACT and the pathogen has partial artemisinin resistance. In this case, the pathogen would stay longer in a person's circulation. And the poorer response to treatment means that there are a greater number of plasmodium in the person's blood. So, there is a higher chance for this person to be exposed to the vector, which is the Anopheles mosquitoes. More infected Anopheles mosquitoes would be available to feed on uninfected people. In C, you have a photomicrograph of a blood smear that contains trophozoids. Then, you have a passage about a protein called PFK13, which is important for the development of trophozoid. There is also a table showing you two mutations on the gene codes for this protein. Both mutations lead to artemisinin resistance. Question 1. Using gene KH13 and mutation F446i as examples, explain the difference between a gene and a gene mutation. Since the question wants you to use these two examples, it is important that you don't just give the general definitions of these two terms without referring to the examples. First of all, link the both of them to the term. Kelch13 is a gene, since it codes for a protein called PFK13. F446i is a gene mutation, as T is replaced by A. Then, provide the definitions for both of them. Mutation means that there is an altered sequence of nucleotides or bases in DNA. Gene codes for the production of a polypeptide. 
You can also get the third mark if you mention that gene mutation produces an altered polypeptide or protein. Here we have some data on the research. A drug is being used on two strains of Plasmodium falciparum. There are three groups of each strain, one with no mutation, and another two has two different types of mutations. The table shows you their survival rate when different concentration of the drug is being used. You have to state the main conclusions that can be drawn from the results shown in the table. There are many things you can observe from the table, but the question wants the main conclusions, so make sure that you pick the most prominent observations. Firstly, if you refer to cultures 1 and 4, if there is no mutation, all of them are killed at 700 nanometer per dm cube. In general, for all cultures, higher concentration of DHA causes lower survival rate compared to lower concentration. When you compare the mutated strains with the one without mutation, both mutations lead to a higher survival rate for both strains. If you compare strain A to B regardless of mutations, strain A has a higher survival rate. Lastly, if you compare the two types of mutations, C580Y causes higher survival rate than F446I. Question 4 is about the airways of gas exchange system. You have a table showing you the number of goblet cells in epithelium of different airways. The function of goblet cells is mentioned here. You need to suggest and explain why respiratory bronchioles do not have any goblet cells. You have to remember the structure of bronchioles in order to answer this question. Apart from having no goblet cells, respiratory bronchioles have little to no slater epithelial cells as well, and it has a very small size. The presence of mucus here can hinder the entry of air to alveoli, as the lumens of respiratory bronchioles are very narrow. Since they are few or no cilia present, it's very difficult to move mucus in this section. If mucus is found here, it will increase the distance for diffusion of respiratory gases, for example, oxygen and carbon dioxide. It will also increase the risk of infection because of the trapped pathogens. Figure 4.1 is a photomicrograph of a section through a bronchial, which is surrounded by alveoli. The first question wants you to describe the differences between the epithelium of bronchioles and the epithelium of alveoli other than differences in the number of goblet cells. Since alveoli is a gas exchange surface, it has squamous epithelium or squamous epithelial cells. Bronchioles are not the surface for gas exchange. It has columnar epithelial cells. Any description of the appearance of the cells will give you a mark as well. Beside that, bronchioles have ciliated epithelium, while alveoli do not. You can also get one mark if you mention about the surfactant cell which is also found in alveoli. The second question wants you to identify tissue X and outline its function. X is found at the outer part of the wall and the cells look spindle shaped and long. It is smooth muscle. They can contract. By doing this, they can change or decrease the diameter of bronchial. This can also control the airflow to and from the alveoli. In question 5, you have some descriptions of collagen and a diagram showing you the primary structure of the polypeptide chain. You have to explain how the primary structure shown in the figure indicates that the structure of polypeptide is suited to be a component of a collagen molecule. Remember that you must refer to the diagram in your answer. You can see that every third amino acid is glycine. Glycine is the smallest amino acid as the R group is only one hydrogen. Because of that, glycine allows tight coiling of polypeptides to form triple helix. Another thing you can mention is that glycine can form hydrogen bonds with other polypeptides of triple helix. There is one mark for AVP as well. For example, proline and alanine are also small amino acids, so they allow tight coiling as well. B asks you to describe the process of exocytosis. After a protein is being processed in Golgi, it will be packed into secretory vesicles. Then, the vesicles move by microtubules or cytoskeleton to the cell surface membrane. ATP is required in this process. The vesicles will then fuse with the cell surface membrane. There is one mark for AVP. 
For example, the budding of vesicles from Golgi occurs on its trans phase, and the fusion of vesicles with the cell surface membrane is due to the merging of their phospholipid bilayers. C talks about a hydrolytic enzyme called collagenase and their inhibitors. The first question wants you to state and explain what the outcome will be for the composition of the extracellular matrix if collagenase inhibitor activity is needed. Firstly, let's state the outcome. If inhibitor activity is needed, collagen is not broken down or hydrolyzed. Then, give a detail of how inhibitors work. For example, it causes the substrate, collagen, to no longer fit into the active site of the enzyme. When this happens, collagen continues to be synthesized or released rather than broken down. Two is about the effect of a non-competitive inhibitor on Vmax and Km of an enzyme. You need to remember the graph to answer this question. Vmax will decrease while Km remains unchanged. Question 6 gives you some information on xylem and phloem. In A, you have to explain why water is the main component of xylem sap and phloem sap. First of all, talk about the properties of water which makes it suitable for this role. Water is a solvent for assimilates of minerals, ions, and polar molecules. You can also write this point from the aspect of the substances. They do accept if you just mention that water is a good or universal solvent. Then, there is one mark each when you relate the properties of water to the feature of both of the tissue. For xylem, you can talk about adhesion and cohesion or how it forms the transpiration stream. For phloem, water is important to build up hydrostatic pressure for mass flow or translocation to occur. There is an AVP mark. For example, when you talk about water potential gradient in a correct context. B wants you to match three different cells to the events related to them. Let me briefly talk about the process here. Firstly, companion cells pumps proton to its apoplasts. Then, Proton and sucrose are co-transported back to it. Sucrose then diffuses into sieve tube element via plasma dense matter. If you remember the process, then it should be quite easy for you to match the events to the cells. That's all for today. If you think my videos are useful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me at the comment section. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.